All right, so let's turn over to Mark chapter 4. And I'm going to start teaching on the integrity of God's Word. I'm sure that all of you here have heard some of my teaching and uh, are aware of some of the things that I teach. And uh, really the heart and the soul of what God has taught me is what I call spirit, soul, and body. Other people would call it your identity in Christ, uh, in Him realities. There's all kinds of ways of referring to it. But before I could teach on those things, if you don't value, if you don't put the proper value on the Word of God, if you don't understand the power that is in the Word of God, well, then everything I'm going to teach you is really useless because my revelation and everything I do is through the Word of God. And unless you put the same value on the Word of God that I do, it's not going to have the impact on you that it should. So I'm starting to teach about the integrity of God's Word. And in Mark chapter 4 are two of the most important parables that the Lord ever revealed to me. Matter of fact, Mark chapter 4 in the first um, 20 verses, Jesus said about this, that if you don't understand this parable, this is up in Mark chapter 4, and in verse 13, he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? If you look in Matthew chapter uh, 13, it's the same parable over there. It's said just a little bit differently, but it's basically saying that if you don't understand the principles that are in this parable, you won't understand any of the things that he teaches. That's a huge statement. In other words, this is the key to unlocking the truths of God's Word. That's how important these parables are. This, this ought to be one of the most important things that God has ever spoken to you. This is just powerful. These are things that I use every single day of my life. So I'm going to come back to this teaching on Mark 14 and the interpretation that was given in verses 14, or excuse me, Mark chapter 4, verses 14 through 20. But I want to drop down right now to Mark chapter 4, verse 26. And here's another parable that he gave. It's the same point that he's making, just a different way of making this. And in Mark 4, 26, it says, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. Man, that is awesome. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture. If that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet. This is just awesome right here. And I know some of you are thinking, oh boy, that doesn't do that much for me. You need to meditate on this because this is just tremendous revelation. He's talking about seed here, but he's really talking about the Word of God. If you look in Mark 4, 14, it says, the sower soweth the Word. This parable that he had given was about a man throwing seed. And this is back in the days when they didn't dig furrows and space their seed. They just scattered their seed. And it's talking about a man that just threw seed on four different types of ground. And it's not really a parable about how to grow crops. It's using this natural illustration that people were very well acquainted with to illustrate how the kingdom of God works. And it's comparing the word of God to a seed. That's what this says. The sower soweth the word. This is not about how to be a farmer. It's about how the kingdom works. And it is really significant that he compared the Word of God to a seed. You know, today in our modern world, we are, most of us are pretty far removed from being a farmer and dealing with seeds and things. We understand it to a degree, but it's not dominant in our life. Most of us think our vegetables come from the grocery store, <laughs> but they don't grow at the grocery store. If you, yeah, I'm not going to spend time to explain all of this, but uh, they do grow in the ground. Somebody has to plant a seed and work the ground and harvest it and bring it to the grocery store. You know, that meat that you get in the store was actually an animal at one time. Amen. <laughs> and it's not only true of, of plants and animals. Did you know that you were a seed? Yes. The whole universe operates off of seeds. 
And again, we don't think about this, but it is absolutely true that everything in this world is a product of a seed. All of these trees that you see, every one of them is a product of a seed. You were a product of a seed. Every animal, every bird, every insect was a pro pro uh, product of a seed. Without seeds, nothing happens. And we understand this in the natural. If a person was to just, you know, lay down on the ground and start praying and fasting and believing for crops to grow, but they never planted a seed, you'd think this person is absolutely crazy. What's wrong with you? You don't get... Yeah, you know, fruit growing by just praying over it. You have to plant a seed. And if you pr plant a seed, then you can pray over it and maybe increase the uh, harvest and things like that. But you've got to plant a seed. We understand this in the natural. But did you know in the spiritual realm, people just do this all the time. There are people praying for healing. What seed have you sown for healing? I've had people come up and they'll say, I'm believing God for a healing. I say, well, what scripture are you standing on? And I say, well, uh, isn't there, I forget if it's in the old covenant or the new covenant, but somewhere doesn't it say something like by his stripes, we are healed someplace? That's not how it works. That's like a woman saying, well, it, it, doesn't a man have to somehow or another contribute a seed? Maybe if I just stand next to him, is that close enough? Uh, <laughs> If I drink the water after somebody who's pregnant, can I get pregnant? Uh, no. I'm not going to explain all of this. I'm going to assume that most of you understand what I'm talking about. But I'm telling you, you have to plant a seed. And we would think that a person in the natural is absolutely stupid who is believing for a harvest and you never planted a seed. And yet how many people can't even quote a scripture and find it about by his stripes we're healed? And you wonder why you aren't healed. You have to have a little bit more interaction with the word than just to say, doesn't it say someplace? Isn't it somewhere in there? You can't just stand close to a man and get pregnant. You can't just say, isn't it in the Bible someplace? The word has to come alive to you. It has to be planted in your heart. And, then, and I'm amazed at how many people are believing for a healing and yet you couldn't quote me a scripture. Or you might be able to vaguely refer to it, but you couldn't find it. You got to have more interaction. There's got to be more intercourse with the Word of God than just, doesn't the Bible say someplace? Doesn't God want to prosper me? Well, what scripture do you have? What scriptures have you been planting in your heart? You know, in my chapel service, I talked about for two years, I took a hundred scriptures and meditated on them. And all of a sudden, boom, this revelation come and prosperity comes. Everybody would love to have the prosperity and everybody wants to say, man, I wish I could build $70 million worth of buildings debt free. I wish I could do all of this. How much time have you spent in the word? Have you meditated on the scriptures that I meditated on? Have you been doing what I'm doing? This is one of the problems, see, that people come into the school and they see these other instructors and they see people prospering and they hear testimonies about people being raised from the dead and things and they think, well, man, this is great. I believe I'm going to do this. And so they just go out and I, if uh, Barry Bennett can do it, bless God, I can do it. And so they just stand and believe that you hadn't spent the time in the Word, you hadn't sown the Word, you hadn't meditated in the Word the way He has. And when you don't see the exact same results in 24 hours, you start saying, well, this stuff doesn't work. No, it works. You just got to give it time. See, this parable right here, it's talking about that the Word of God is like a seed and a man planted it in the ground and he sleep, slept and rose night and day. Now, this is important because this is showing that it takes time. I mentioned this in the chapel, but it's seed time and then harvest. There's time in between seed and harvest. And there's a lot of people that think, well, God is God. God can just do anything he wants to. So God, I've got a need. Boom. I want a miracle. There's a seed, time, and harvest. Have you planted the seed? Have you given it time? It takes time. And some of you are going to see these people who are prospering and things are happening. And you're going to say, well, then why doesn't it work for me just immediately? It didn't work for them immediately. Amen. It takes time. This is really important that the Lord see chose a seed because this is a God created system. Amen. If he would have chosen a physical system, like let's just take school, for example, it says the kingdom of God is like school. You got to study. You got to do that. You know what? That's a man-made system. Right. 
And you can cheat in school. You could, you could copy the answer off somebody else's paper. You can cram for a harvest. I bet you every one of you in school did not pay attention the way that you should have. But right before your exam, you stayed up all night long. You crammed for your test and you got it in your short term memory and you passed the test. And yet if they were to give you that test again today, you'd flunk it because you did not learn it. You beat the system. You crammed for a test. But you know what? You can't cram for a harvest. You can't wait until the night before harvest and stay up all night long and plant that seed and fertilize it and do everything and get your harvest. You, you just are going to miss out. You can't cheat a God system. This is the reason he compared it to a seed. There are laws that govern how seed works. And one of them is you have to plant the seed and then just sleep and rise night and day. You can't plant it and then tomorrow go dig it up and leave it out for 12 hours and then go plant it tomorrow night and then dig it up. And just, you do that and you'll kill that seed. You aren't going to get your harvest. There's some people, see, that will take the Word of God and boy, in a crisis situation, they'll believe God and they'll get serious and they'll focus on God and believe. But then tomorrow, they get right back into their carnal life. They aren't believing God. And then over the weekend, they're going to get back into the Word and they're going to study again. And you just, you don't live by faith. You just visit there. You just vacation there every once in a while. You aren't going to see a harvest. It's not going to work for you the way that it works for everybody else. You got to plant it and you got to leave it planted. You can't dig up your seed. You've got to commit yourself to the word of God and take the word of God and sow it in your heart and get to where you don't violate it. This is one of the things that's going to happen here in school that many of you won't even be aware of what's happening, but we are forcing you to be in the Word four hours a day. And then you'll go home and you'll think about it. And did you know, just by virtue of the fact how much time you are spending in the Word, it's just going to start producing. Things are going to start happening without you even realizing it. And this is one of the reasons I'm so excited about school versus the rest of the ministry that I do because people will listen to me and there's a few people that will take the word and just meditate in it all day long and go to our website and get all of the teaching and stuff and they'll just saturate themselves with it. But the average person will just listen. They'll be blessed and excited and for 30 minutes it'll be good and then they go to work and they get their mind on something else and forget about it until the next day and they're in and out and you aren't going to see the same harvest when people do it that way. But when you just immerse yourself, when the Word of God gets planted and you leave it there and it just stays there, and this is what your mind has stayed on all of the time, I guarantee you, it'll start producing a supernatural harvest. So it says in verse 27, He should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up he knoweth not how. Boy, this is so exciting. This is powerful. You don't have to understand this. You know what? Mankind does not understand a seed. Yes. Now you might think, oh yeah, they do. They use seeds all of the time. They can, they've learned how to cooperate with it. They've learned how to plant it. They've learned how to do certain things. But you know what? Man can't create a seed. We, we don't understand. We can't reproduce it. You could produce something. You could take the cumulative power of the entire human race, billions of people and billions of dollars and everything and take all of the best scientists and they could create something that would look like a kernel of corn. It might taste like a kernel of corn. It might have the same weight as a kernel of corn, but you plant it in the ground, it'll never germinate and produce another deal. We don't understand it, but that doesn't keep us from using it. You can still plant corn. I don't, under, I don't understand how a little acorn turns into this huge tree. It's amazing. It is amazing. It is a miracle. Every seed is a miracle. I don't understand it. But you know what? I can use it. I, I don't have to understand it. It says he sleeps and rises night and day and it springs and grows up of itself. He knows not how. Did you know in every seed... God has put in there, I don't know exactly what it is, but He has put in there everything it takes to overcome and to produce and reproduce. I've got a rock on my property that's bigger than this auditorium, bigger than the top of this auditorium. It's called Indian Head Rock. I've chiseled out a seat on the top of it and I sit up there and watch the world as they go by. It's awesome. <laughs> and anyway, on the top of this rock, there's little dips 
and stuff like this and their dirt gets in there and then it rains and it gets wet and then a bird drops a seed. And I've got seeds in the top of this huge rock that is over a hundred feet tall. And these seeds, this little tiny seed is splitting this huge boulder. The power that's in that seed is just phenomenal. A little tiny seed gets in there and it splits this huge boulder. I could put a stick of dynamite in it and it wouldn't break that boulder. But that little tiny seed's got all of this power in it. The Word of God is like this seed. It's powerful. And you don't have to understand it. You just have to believe that if I'll sow this Word in my heart and sleep and rise night and day, this thing is going to change me. And it goes on to say in the next verse, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. Did you know if you look of herself up in the Greek, you know what this word is? It's a tomatos. It's the word we get automatic from, automatically. The earth brings forth fruit automatically. It's just a law of God. You take a seed and put it in the ground. The ground doesn't have to sit there and analyze it and say, do I want this seed to grow? It doesn't have to, you know, it just works. And you can put any seed in the ground. And there's certain grounds that are acid or alkaline or something, and some seeds may not prosper as well as others. But the ground just, God made ground that it just produces. Whatever is planted in it, it starts taking these nutrients out of there. You know, we'll sit there and say, look at this huge tree that was actually in this seed. Did you know that that seed doesn't actually have that tree in it? That seed somehow or another takes all of the nutrients and the stuff that's in the ground and organizes them and draws them out and produces the tree. It's not the seed. The seed is the catalyst. The seed is the thing that makes it all work. But the ground supplies all of this. If you put a seed in real shallow earth, it's not going to produce because the ground isn't sufficient to be able to supply the seed what it needs. And in this parable... The, the ground is our heart. God made your heart that when, man, I got so much stuff I want to say here. I got to organize how I'm going to say this. But God made your heart that thoughts, impressions, feelings, seeds, your heart just instantly, automatically starts growing and producing whatever you put in you. If you put in you fear, if you put in you pornography, if you put in you anything, it, your heart doesn't know the difference. Your heart will just start bringing these thoughts, these things that you plant in your heart to life. And likewise, if you will put in the Word of God, your heart will just automatically begin to start bringing the Word of God to pass in your life. It's impossible for you not to be healed meditating on the Word of God day and night. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 says, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Carnally minded doesn't mean necessarily sinful minded. Sin, all sin is carnal, but not all carnality is sin. Carnal just means natural. Five, of the five senses is what it means. Of your, what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. If you are just thinking in the natural that's death. The carnal, it didn't say carnal mindedness tends towards death. Carnal mindedness is death. Being naturally minded, thinking naturally. You don't have to be sinful. You don't have to be evil. You don't have to be demonic. Just be normal. Just be natural and you'll die. Carnal mindedness is death, but spiritual mindedness is life and peace. What is spiritual mindedness? It says in John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's word is spirit and life. So to be spiritually minded is to be word minded. If you plant the seed in your heart, your heart just brings forth life and peace. You know, if I wanted to go to your house and see if you had a garden and if you had planted a garden, I don't have to be there when you plant your garden to tell what you've planted. All I got to do is see what's growing. And I can tell you what you planted. And either you planted it or you let somebody else or you let a bird drop a seed or something. But I can guarantee you whatever's growing in your garden was planted there. 
And likewise, I don't have to be with you. I don't have to go home with you to find out what you've been doing. I can look at your life and I can tell what's, what you've been doing. Because if you're experiencing death, you've been carnally minded. If you're experiencing life, you've been spiritually minded. Your life is producing the seeds that you've sown in it. And somehow you're thinking, that's not, I didn't have anything to do with this. Yes, you did. The Bible is absolute. Somebody's saying, but I didn't think, I, I didn't pray for cancer. I didn't ask for cancer. No, but your thinking was sick. You were thinking, I'm only human. You heard a report that cancer is incurable and immediately that caused fear in your heart and you allowed that fear to grow instead of taking the word of God that says that no weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you will condemn. You didn't think right. You just thought like a natural human being and, and you said, but God, I'm only human. That's not true. I'm not only human. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. Man, I am powerful. I'm born again. And you may not have thought I want cancer, but you thought I'm only human. I'm just a person. What can I do? That thinking allowed that seed to grow on the inside of you. Your life is the way you have thought that it's going to be. Isaiah, uh, let's see, where is that? Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Your life is the way you have thought. And again, I didn't, I didn't think on divorce. No, but you thought in ways that allowed that to come to pass. Many of you, it could go, you could go all the way back to when you got married. You didn't pick the one that God had for you. You went out and married whoever you wanted. You leaned under your own understanding. And you're the one that created the problem in the first place. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not trying to condemn you, but I'm trying to say that the Word of God works, brothers and sisters. And if you aren't seeing the Word work in your life, it's not the seed that's the problem. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23 says, We are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the Word of God that lives and abides forever. The Word of God is an incorruptible seed. The word used there in 1 Peter 2, 23 is the word spora, where we get spores from. That's how a flower pollinates, how it spreads its seed. And spora is a derivative of the word sperma, where we get the word sperm from. You are born again by an incorruptible seed, sperm. The Word of God is incorruptible. If you aren't experiencing victory in your life, it's not the word that has failed. It's the fact that we have let something else be planted in our life other than the word of God. If you got sickness growing in your life, your thinking is sick. If you've got poverty, your thinking is poor in the area of prosperity. If you've got broken relationships, you aren't thinking right. To have friends, a man must show himself friendly and somewhere down the line, things aren't working right. I'm not saying any of these things to condemn anybody, but I'm saying you've got to get to the place that you believe that God's word is an incorruptible seed. And I've got a teaching entitled Effortless Change, which is along the lines of what I'm talking about. If you hadn't heard that, you ought to get this teaching. It'll change your life. But it, it speaks about how the kingdom works and the kingdom works off of a seed. Instead of praying, oh God, heal me. Take the seed of healing Amen. and plant it in your life. And if you leave it there and meditate on it day and night, you will be healed. It's impossible not to be healed. Amen. Amen. That is so simple. You got to have somebody help you to misunderstand what I'm saying. Amen. But there's a lot of, there's people sitting right here think, oh, I'm not sure it's that simple. And see, you have allowed other thinking and that other thinking is taking root. You don't put the importance on the Word of God. You don't believe the power of the Word of God the way that you should. And that very thing is keeping the Word about healing from producing in your life is because you've entertained other thoughts and you're letting those things grow. In Proverbs chapter 4, it says, verse 20 through 22, that God's Word is, is uh, health unto all of your flesh and life to those who find it. God's word is health to you. So take God's word and plant the scriptures on healing in your heart and you will be healed. Psalms 107 verse 20 says he sent his word and healed them 
and delivered them from all their destructions. The Word of God will heal you and deliver you. Take the seed and plant it in your heart. Same thing is true of prosperity. The same thing's true on everything. This is how the kingdom works. It just works automatically. You've never seen an apple tree just groan and shake and then, you know, let out a scream. Uh, and here's an apple. <laughs> That's not the way that it happens. You just plant a seed and that give it time and it just grows and boom. It is the nature to produce an apple. And yet Christians find change to be so hard. Oh God, it's so hard to change. Why is it hard to change? Because you aren't planting seeds. You're praying and begging God to set you free from dope addiction, from cigarettes, from something. But you're just praying and asking for a miracle. But you aren't taking the word of God and planting seeds that would displace that stuff and get you free. You, you will call a prayer chain. You will spend great expense. You will get thousands of people to pray, but you wouldn't take the word of God and meditate in it day and night. Good. There's nothing hard about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is simple. And I'm promising you are going to experience this. Sitting under the word four hours a day for nine months here. At the end of nine months, it's like Daniel said, on the first day, you need to take a before picture right now and be ready for your after picture because I guarantee you're going to change. Amen. And some of you will think, well, I'm not sure about that. We had this one guy come. His name was Taj. He was a black guy from the inner city of Chicago and he didn't want to be here. He told everybody he didn't want to be here. The only reason he was here is because his mother bought him a car and got him an um, apartment and furniture and stuff and says, if you'll go there for six months, I'll give you all of this stuff. And so he told everybody, I don't want to be here. I'm just here because my mother said, me. he was a nice guy. I liked the guy, but he just, he didn't want to be here. And he told us that. And he says, man, after Christmas break, I'm gone. You'll never see me again. And uh, so anyway, he sat under the word. And did you know on Christmas break, he went home, told us, he says, you'll never see me again. And when he got home, he, re he didn't realize it, but he had changed. He didn't even want to change, but he had changed. He lived in inner city Chicago and two of his friends had been killed during the months that he had been here. He went back and found out he didn't fit in anymore. His life had changed and he wasn't even believing for it to change, but it just brought forth fruit of itself automatically. And Taj came back and finished the whole two years. He now pastors in Colorado Springs and has a big church down there. And I've heard that Taj may be coming back and doing one of our third year courses. But I mean, it works better if you cooperate. <laughs> but you're going to find out that this is just a law of God. You sit and listen to the word. You listen to truth and stuff. And the truth is going to set you free. And it is really this simple. It is not hard to live the Christian life. It's actually hard not to be victorious. Yes. It's hard to be sick if you meditate on the Word day and night. You know, it's been 49 years, I, nearly 50 years, and I just don't get sick. I don't believe in being sick. Amen. I don't get sick. Amen. I haven't been depressed in nearly 50 years. I don't get depressed. I'm not going to be depressed. That's right. And some people are like, oh man, that's you. You can't do that. Well, don't wake me up because this is how I'm living. <laughs> And I'm telling you, you can, if you'll meditate in the word, it says in uh, Joshua chapter one, verse eight, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you, you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Again, this is talking about the word of God. It will bring forth fruit of itself, but you have to meditate in it day and night. There is no problem with the word. The only problem is with the soil that we don't give it. We don't give the seed, the attention, the priority that we need to. And notice it also goes on to say in this parable, man, I could minister on this for hours and I've got less than 20 minutes here. It says the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Here's another great truth. These are laws. This is how the kingdom works. There's first the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. Growth again. It shows steps and stages. 
In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. The blade, the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. There's growth. And again, this is a mistake that people made. There was one of our students that came here and they began to see me and other people here talk about how God will supply your need. We were teaching on prosperity. And so they went out and got them a house that cost $1,500 a month. This is back 20 something years ago. You could have gotten a house for $500 a month. I think it was actually $2,500 a month that they paid. But see, they were believing God and they were into this and they just believed God was going to supply their needs. So they went and got a house. It was like $2,500 a month 20 years ago. And uh, anyway, within a short period of time, they were destitute. They had to move out of the house. They couldn't pay their tuition. They couldn't do a lot of things. And they were just, you know, why didn't this work? We were believing God. You, there's first the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. You can't jump from never having seen God move in your life and supply the needs to where everything is just working. If you go from zero to a thousand miles an hour, all at once, you're dead. Yeah. That's not acceleration. That's a wreck. Amen. <laughs> you have to start slow and build up your speed. You, you have to believe God to supply $500 a month before you can believe for $600 a month and things like this. If the Lord would have told me, you know, if I would have had to have started out my ministry believing for over $5.5 million a month, and if he had have done that to me 20 years ago, it would have killed me. I had to first of all believe for, man, I remember the very first covenant that Jamie and I wrote out when we moved to Colorado Springs. We were believing for $700 a month. Yeah. That would pay me, my salary. It would pay our radio bill. I was only on one radio station and allow us to give over a hundred and something dollars a month. And we started believing for $700 a month. And that was over twice what we had been getting. I was stretching myself. I was believing, but I believed for $700 a month before I started believing for $5.5 million a month. You got to do things. You got to recognize it takes time and that you, you can't eat an elephant all at once. You'll choke, but you could eat an elephant if you eat it one bite at a time. You know, we had a guy in school here in the very first class. We were reminiscing about this the other day. And anyway, he had come out of the, um, uh, a mental institution. He had been in a mental institution his whole life. He was about 40 years old. And he came here and he was really a nice guy. I really liked the guy. He had a good heart, but he just had been in a mental institution and he didn't have people skills. He didn't know things. He would sit in the class and turn around facing the class and just pick his nose in front of everybody. It was just grossing everybody out. He had no people skills whatsoever. And I made him a personal project. And I just, after school, I started bringing him in and we started studying the book of Proverbs and teaching him how to get along with people, how to do things. And I mean, he really improved a lot. And he got so fired up. He got so excited that he started believing God for great things. And there was a place in Manitou Springs called the Cliff House. It's now been restored, but at the time it was a hotel that was built in the 1800s and it had had a fire and it was derelict and it had been empty for, I don't know, a decade or something like this. And it was a stone structure. So the structure was still there, but all the insides had been gutted. And uh, anyway, he went down found out how much it would cost to buy that place, found out how much it would cost to renovate it. There was like a hundred and something rooms in it and he was going to renovate it, fix it up. He had a whole thing that he had printed out on this and it was going to cost five point something million dollars to buy it, to renovate it. He was going to rent it out to Bible college students. He figured out how much he could charge. He would be able to make a profit. And I mean, it was a lot of work and it was really good. And he came and presented this whole thing to me and, uh, he was really excited and he just showed it to me. And he says, what do you think? And I said, I can guarantee you this is not God. And it's just like you popped a balloon. He just, I mean, he went from being all excited to discourage. Why would you say that? Says, I'm trying to believe God. I'm trying to believe for things to happen. And I said, Jerry, you have never worked a day in your life. You have never earned a dime in your life. You have never managed anything. 
You had your family take care of you and then the government has supported you. You have never worked a day in your life and you're going to jump from having done nothing to coming up with $5.5 million and you're going to manage this thing. I said, that's not God. God would never do that to anybody. You've got to learn some things along the way. And I encouraged him. I said, now this is great that you're dreaming and thinking, but find something bite-sized. Go get a job. <laughs> Get a job and instead of having living off of your family, pay your own way and get to where you can believe for that and then go out and get you a house and then go out and get you a car and then do some things and then start believing for some things. Amen. And see, there are some of you who think, well, man, I just, I just think God could do it supernaturally. That is not how the kingdom works. The kingdom works off of this principle of seed, time, and harvest. It's like a seed. There's always the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. There are some of you that are wanting to go out and have a worldwide ministry and change the world, and you've never taught a Sunday school class. You've never taught a Bible study. You've never ministered to anybody. And yet you're all of a sudden just going to leapfrog and pass all of these steps and go into ministry. That is not the way the kingdom works. And some of you might think, well, boy, you're discouraging me. I'm trying to encourage you because I can guarantee you, you are not going to change things. You can't cram for a harvest. You may cram for a test, but you can't cram for a harvest. You can't circumvent this system. The kingdom of God operates off of these principles. The word of God is the seed that makes everything work, but you have to plant it. You have to leave it there. It takes time. It'll work automatically, but then there's going to be first a blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. This is just the way that the kingdom works. Some of you may not understand this, but when the Lord called you here, it's because he's got great plans for you. He's wanting to do some awesome things. Your future is so bright, you got to squint to look at it. Amen. But it's not going to happen tomorrow. Right. That's right. And the reason he called you here is to sow seeds into your life, to teach you some things, to equip you, to prepare you. You know, if the Lord would have revealed to me back 49 years ago when he first called me, and I knew that I was going to reach people all over the world, but if he would have shown me that I'd have to build this building and that building, 150 something million dollars worth of buildings on this property, that I'd have to have $5.5 million a month just to pay my bills, I guarantee you, it would have done one of two things to me. It would have probably scared me so much. It would have so overwhelmed me that I'd have run the other direction. God, you got the wrong guy. I'm out of here. Or if I would have embraced it, I would have become so impatient that I would have never have taken the time to grow and to do the things along the way that I did. God will just show you things one little bit at a time. And until you fulfill that, he's not going to lead you to the other thing. Not because he doesn't love you, but because he loves you so much. Why would God show you the whole plan for your life and make you responsible and accountable for it when you aren't mature enough to be able to do it yet? That'd just make you more accountable. If you aren't going to be faithful in this small thing that he gives you, he won't show you other things because he doesn't want to make you accountable and make you responsible for failing in all of these other areas. He'll just deal with you little bit by little bit, show you things one step at a time, and he will nurture you and mature you and bring you along as you're able to handle it because he loves you so much. Some of you are, God, why aren't you using me? Oh God, use me. It's because you aren't usable. <laughs> and I know some of you think, I'm paying for this abuse. I'm trying to help you. I'm telling you, it, God loves you. He wants to use you more than you want to be used, but he loves you so much. He's not going to put you out there and make you a target so that the devil can attack you if you aren't mature enough to be able to handle it. You should never be praying, oh God, use me. What you should be praying is, oh God, make me usable. Yes. Yes. You start meditating in the word day and night. And I guarantee you, you will be used of God. Yes. So there's much, much more that I could say about that. But let's jump down to verse 35. And remember that he had taught this parable about the sower sowing the seed. He had taught this parable that we just dealt with about the man who threw the seed in the ground and slept and rose night and day. 
Actually, if you go to like my uh, study Bible that I've got, my living commentary, where it organizes the New Testament chronologically instead of by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He taught 14 parables this day. One day, it's the most teaching we have record of, of anything that Jesus did. And he taught 14 parables about the parable of the tares among the wheat, the woman who lost the coin, the mustard seed becomes the greatest herb, all of these. All of those parables were taught in one day. And it says in verse 35, and the same day, the same day is what? The same day as all of these parables about how the kingdom works and it being like a seed. And the same day when the even was come, he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Have any of you ever felt like this? God, don't you care? I, I need to be healed. Why haven't you healed me? Oh God, heal me. Oh God, prosper me. Oh God, save this person. Oh God, touch this person. Oh God, give me this job. And, and God, why aren't you doing anything? This is exactly, they woke him up. Why aren't you doing anything? Bail, roll, do something. He was asleep. And you know, this was an open boat. It wasn't a cabin cruiser. He didn't have decks below ground. It wasn't that he was dry and was oblivious to what was going on. He was in an open boat and it says that the boat was full. So that means he was sloshing around in the water. He was well aware of what was going on and he wasn't doing a blooming thing. He was laying there asleep on a pillow. And they said, don't you care about us? Do something. And so it says, he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Most of us would think, man, why, why would he sit there and criticize them? They were about to drown. They were in this storm. The boat was full. He wasn't doing anything to help them. You know, it was the same day that he had been teaching them about the word is a seed. The word is supernatural. You get a word from God, it will produce a miracle. All you have to do is put it in your heart. You know what he did? He gave them a pop quiz on what he had been teaching them. He'd been teaching about the power of the word and then he gave them a word. Go to the other side. He didn't say, let's go halfway and drown. He said, let's go to the other side. The one who created the heavens and the earth said, we are going to the other side. They had a word from God, but they let the wind and the waves and the storm take their attention off of the word and they started operating in fear. It wasn't Jesus' place to still the storm. It was their place. He had taught them about the authority and the power that they had. They should have stood on that word and they should have done it. Did you know it's not God's place to heal you? By His stripes you were healed. He's already done it. And He gave you the seed that says, 1 Peter 2, 24, by His stripes you were healed. Now you take the seed and you plant it in your heart and quit asking God to heal you and instead take the seed of healing that He's given you and put it in your heart and speak it out your mouth and stand on it and give it time. And I guarantee you the seed will produce healing in your body. Amen. It's impossible for you to stay sick meditating on the Word of God day and night because to be spiritually minded, word minded, is life and peace. Amen. Man, that is awesome. I just about preach myself happy. <laughs> Man, this is awesome. This is worth all of the school right here. Amen. This one class, if you got this and if you were to believe it, understand it, apply it. And if you operated in nothing but what we've said right here, this would transform your life. Amen. You take these seeds and you plant them in your heart and you do it day after day and you don't dig them up. You stay consistent. You protect it. That's, we'll get into that in the next hour when I teach on the other parable in this uh, chapter. You have to protect it against things that come to choke the word and to steal the word from you. But you do these things and the Word of God will just automatically 
change your life. And you don't have to understand it. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. All you got to do is just meditate in the Word day and night and do whatever it says and you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. The Lord put it to me this way. He says, if you would do these things that I just talked about, meditate in the Word, He says, you would have to backslide on me to keep from accomplishing my will for you. And I believe that is absolutely true. You know, the things that are happening here, I haven't, I didn't pray and beg God, oh God, please give me a Bible college and please help me to, I didn't want a Bible college. He just told me to do this and I just responded to him. I didn't ask for this. And when it came time, we had outgrown our other facility. God, what, what do we do? We had a place in Colorado Springs that was um, 22 acres for $90 million that didn't, it wasn't in the city limits. It was, it was uh, over an hour from here. And they offered that to us. That was the best deal we found. 22 acres for $90 million, no city services in it. And this place just dumped in our lap. $4 million for 157 acres with a $3 million lodge already built on it. And we had somebody come to Jamie and says, do you think that this was God? <laughs> she says, this is a no brainer. You'd have to be dumb not to take this. Amen. I didn't ask for, I hadn't begged. I hadn't done things. It just brings forth fruit of itself. My job is to meditate in the word day and night, renew my mind, listen to the voice of the Lord. And when God tells me, I just obey it and stuff. And God is doing things supernaturally. Man, it's awesome. Some of you are new and you see things and you just think maybe all this came easy, but you don't realize, man, what we've been through and what God has done. And it is not my intellect. <laughs> Some of you might've heard me say this, but my mother died in 2009 and she was 96 years old. And anyway, right before she died, she was asking me would, you know, to tell her again all that the Lord was doing through the ministry. She worked for me and opened our mail for over 20 years. And she, just a, she was really excited about what God was doing. And anyway, I was telling her about all the things worldwide. And she stuck her little bony finger right in my face and she said, Andy, you know that's God. And I said, yes, ma'am, I know it's God. And then she says, you aren't smart enough to do this. <laughs> And it's true. And I said, it's absolutely true. I am not smart. It is not my brilliance. Yeah. Some of you don't know me. You only see me on television and I might come across better than I am. But the more you get to know me, you're going to think, man, that's not God. Uh, that's not Andrew doing that. That has to be God that's doing this stuff. I'm guarantee you, I'm just about as plain as you can get. I had a guy come up to me one time and he says, you know, you are as plain as dirt. <laughs> but that's what you need for a seed. Amen. <laughs> Dirt's really good for a seed. So praise God. Just take the seed, sow it in your heart, and I guarantee you, you'll change effortlessly. Amen. <laughs>